Friday. That means Monday is Casual Monday. Tuesday, Casual Tuesday. Wednesday, Casual Hump Day. Thursday, Casual Thurs. That's what we call it. And Friday, Casual Shabbat. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. It is Friday, June 23rd, 2023. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Heather Parton, or Digby, will be joining us. To look back on the week that is, was. Meanwhile, Judge Block's Wyoming abortion pill ban, the first in the nation abortion pill ban. IRS whistleblower claims the DOJ slowed its investigation into Hunter Biden's taxes. That would be the investigation that presumably they just had a plea deal on that was resolved. Meanwhile, Biden to sign an executive order to expand access to contraception. House Republicans propose Social Security and Medicare cuts. What? But they said, but I saw the state of the U. 3M reaches a $10 billion settlement in that forever chemicals case. Supreme Court allows Biden's deportation policy to proceed. Meanwhile, Joe Biden sucking up to Modi. And Starbucks workers across 150 states plan labor action over pride. And just breaking, Tim Pool still not mad about how bad his music is and how. <laughs> and Bob's Burgers. <laughs> and Bob's Burgers. Breaking. I tell my deepest, darkest uh, <laughs> secrets to Tim Pool. All this and more on today's Majority Report. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry we got a late start today, but you'll see that Emma Biglin is not here. Is the show still on? Is she still on Tim Pool's show? Is it still going? Uh, that's a good question. I think it probably should be about wrapped up, but uh, it looks like it's still live. I mean, I think it like, wasn't the, 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 as of yesterday... In fact, as of this morning, we thought that Emma was going to record the show at 10. It would be one hour long and it would play at 1 p.m. And so we were like, well, let's let we, we will maybe carry part of the show live that she's on with Tim Pool at one. And then uh, they switched it up um, at the last minute. They also didn't tell her who the guest was, the, the this right wing ron paul uh guy uh the uh, a horowitz freedom foundation guy who likes child labor which evan hasn't even had to mention yet <laughs> yeah i, I, I we will obviously get into it more but i just want to say that every single thing we were told for the most part was not true about the particulars of the of the conversation but yeah, yeah. And hey, look, we we it's okay to trick that's, people into conversations that's totally we i'm all in favor here. of that but there's we no should, light without know. heat right exactly i mean and um uh, I watched part of it, uh, you know, in the middle of prepping and, um, uh, Emma was great. I, I mean, I guess it's still going on. Uh, Tim got very, very angry when she brought up, uh, the part about that shooter who he sort of laughed off, uh, and said was a psyop, I guess, or something to that effect. He got very testy and then about said that. We did the same thing. And then I guess it was TYT after Emma left. And also I don't <laughs> think TYT said that it was a psyop. <laughs> I mean, just slightly off there. Um, and um, and uh, he got very, very upset about the uh, music stuff. And then he sort of claimed that uh, Emma was is saying everything she was told to be said, I don't know, presumably by us or by some other nefarious thing. Now, I will say this. She did leave work early on, uh, was it on Wednesday or Tuesday, to go have lunch with George Soros. And so... <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, Who but knows? Think, to be fair, the other guy did get to have, uh, I don't know what his name is, Sean or something like that, but he did get to have a lunch with the Olin Scafe and uh, Bradley Foundation. So, <laughs> so there you it, go. It, it all evens out. All evens out. Um, and uh, apparently, uh, Tim lied once again about our DM exchange. So I promise I am going to post that after the show today. <laughs> we were going to post it some time ago, and then there was talk that Emma might be on the show. And I thought, oh, he's going to get mad. Cause he gets very, very mad. He gets, he, you know, for yeah. him, for Tim, this is like high school mm -hmm. and he, you know, it's, it's really important that, um, it's all about, you know, how he's represented, not his, uh, issue set or whatever it Even is. Even the way he decides between Trump and DeSantis feels a little bit like manners. Like, oh, DeSantis, uh, doctored an image to make Trump to basically, uh, illustrate, uh, his critique of Trump and Fauci, which, uh, Tim Pool doesn't seem to really want to address specifically, but it's all about AI. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's pretty, um, I mean, it's, it's all like high school, uh, for him, but, um, which is not to say that we can't be sophomoric. I can definitely be sophomoric but it is in uh, goals that are uh, larger. Like, I don't care if I'm not the most popular guy uh, at, uh, you know, in the cafeteria. Um, a lot of elites, they've been talking, Sam, and they don't like to invite you places. And you wonder why. And, you know, I think it's pretty clear that it's just you're, you're uncouth. I'm uncouth. I am uncouth. All right, let's get into this. Um, now, what did I just do with my sound sheet? I keep doing that. Um, this was. Uh, um, you know, this sort of got lost and maybe we'll hear more about it in the context of, of, um, you know, if DeSantis starts to become more prominent in the Republican, uh, campaign, uh, but there were multiple referendums down in Florida. One of the biggest ones was, um, was about voting rights and re-enfranchising felons. There was also, or, or former felons, uh, there was also ones about minimum wage. And when you talk about uh, democracy, democracy is not just about, you know, protecting the vote. It is also, if you have a mechanism for referendums, and then you override these referendums, and we saw Republicans do this in Michigan, I think, in terms of like uh, the, um, you know, the sort of the emergency takeovers uh, a while back, and then Republicans turn around. And they overturn these referendums in the state house in these gerrymandered districts. I mean, why have why not just get rid of referendums? Why not just try and pass a an amendment to the constitution of the state to get rid of uh, referendums if you're not going to abide by them? And uh, here is AOC at a um, one of those like unofficial hearings because of course uh, Democrats can't. Con uh, convene hearings in the house when they're out of power uh with a representative maxwell frost and representative uh, daniel goldman um about uh voting rights and about uh, what's going on in terms of democracy in florida everyday floridians have been exercising their right to democracy they have voted overwhelmingly and organized at the ballot box to institute minimum wage and ron DeSantis tries to preempt and overturn minimum wage Floridians tried to come together in order to get housing costs under control. And what does Ron DeSantis and what does Governor DeSantis and the Republican Party in Florida do? Overturn it. Then we're seeing voting rights restoration. We are seeing a redrawing of and trying to check extreme gerrymandering. And what Governor DeSantis is doing is overriding the will of Floridians. And that at the core is what we need to talk about today. Because frankly, it does not matter what end of the political spectrum you are on in the United States. It doesn't matter if you're a Democrat, a Republican, if you're red or blue, if you're woke or asleep, I don't care. The point is, is that when the people speak at the ballot box, that their will is honored and that the policies and, and officials that they support at the ballot box get instituted by our government. And we should all be very, very concerned when an elected official takes a seat of power and when everyday people vote to have a certain outcome at the ballot box, he takes it. Ron DeSantis takes it upon himself and say, Floridians, 
I know what's better th th for you than what you do. I'm going to take away the power of your voice at the ballot box. I'm going to take your, your power away that you have over your own body. I'm going to take your power away of your ability to be a full citizen and have your voting rights honored in the United States. This should wake everybody up independent of political uh, affiliation. I mean, the that's great messaging. That's great messaging because you're reminding people not only of the fact that most people, even in red Florida, want a minimum uh, wage raised. Most people want to expand the franchise to people. Um, there's a whole host of policies that if you left up to a referendum, and and I and I say this because we see these referendums um, would end up falling at least on a progressive side. But the bottom line is, if you're going to have referendums in your constitution, how do you not buy a, abide by these? And Ron DeSantis, you know, is an ideologue. And he barely uh, won, saw, so of course of, he's going to do that. <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, look, <clears throat> I don't fault. Uh, Republicans for uh, pushing an agenda if they win by one vote. Uh, I mean, that's what I, I the, you, you see something like that in Minnesota uh, on the progressive side. And I'm completely in favor of taking the advantage when uh, you win elections um, rather than govern in it such a defensive manner. But, uh, you know, I saw part of the, the Tim Pool thing with, with Emma where he was uh, saying that he didn't think Ron DeSantis was really in charge of all that really bad stuff in Florida. He just what? signed it as he, governor. That was so funny. Yeah, the le it's the legislature, not Ron, and not DeSantis himself. He should talk to Dave Rubin about that. I'd be curious if Dave would be like, no, actually, uh, actually it's all Ron. He's, he's actually all the best Ron. leader in the country. Yes. <laughs> um, but I can't wait till Monday. We may have to push the guest on Monday and just go over there. <laughs> Maybe honestly, I just do a full, full <laughs> reaction vid. Totally, totally. Um, it's the closest you're going to get to him. Apparently, I don't think this went. I don't think yeah, this really. He, he I don't seems think this really mad about the music. Yeah, and uh, but he, uh, I, I did see part of the. Um, I did see part of the uh, the thing where he implied that somehow in our DMs and and the part where I told him secretly that I didn't. That I you was gotta mad about Bob's burgers. You got to stop confessing your sort of personal foibles and trials and tribulations to your worst enemies. <laughs> All I want to say is I am very, very happy that Steven Crowder has not talked about some of my relationship difficulties that I have uh, expressed to him privately uh, over the years. Yeah, um, actually... Sam's more troubled than you all know. His trick is to uh, get people like Tim Pool and Mike Cernovich and use them to do a therapy in the DMs. Make that's them right. Therapists. Yes, uh, Cernovich has been very, very helpful with uh, some career advice. <laughs> oh my God, uh, folks! We're going to get to uh, uh, Heather Parton in just a moment, uh, but today's episode is brought to you by Zipix. Zipix nicotine toothpicks are a great way to help you stop smoking or vaping for that matter. I used to be a smoker. I know that it is very difficult to quit. First off, let me just tell you right now, if you're not a smoker or a vapor, don't start. It is extremely difficult to quit. Nicotine is, uh, is an addictive uh, chemical. Uh, and um, But if you are trying to quit, one of the easiest ways uh, to quit is to slowly wean yourself off of nicotine. And one of the ways to do that, Zipix toothpicks. No longer have to put smoke and vape in your oils if you need to get your nicotine fix. It is a discreet way to get your fix. It's available in six flavors. They have options in two milligrams and three milligrams of uh, nicotine. Uh, Zipix are uh, Perfect for flights or sporting events, restaurants, literally everywhere else that smoking and vaping are banned. They are also one of the most cost-effective nicotine products on the market. Zipix uh, also, once you like, once you wean, uh, you know, off of like the action of smoking and vaping, that is like, that's the habit that really gets you. It, it, at least that was what it was for me. 
once you wean yourself off of that and fulfill your your oral fixation with a toothpick, which is what I also did, um, you can go from the nicotine they have in two milligram, three milligrams into uh, what I use, which is the caffeine and B12 toothpicks. Zipix has helped tens of thousands of customers in leading a healthier lifestyle. And if you currently smoke or vape, they can probably help you too. Make your lungs happy. Make everybody around you has to smell you happy. Try Zipix nicotine toothpicks. Ditch the cigarettes. Ditch the vape. Get some nicotine-infused toothpicks at ZipixToothpicks.com today. Get 10% off your first order by using the code MAJORITY at checkout. Your lungs will be glad you did. And again, just a disclaimer, this product contains nicotine, which is an addictive chemical. You must be 21 or older to order. Zip more, smoke less with Zipix nicotine toothpicks. Also, today's program sponsored by uh, one of our favorite uh, sponsors, SunsetLakeSebaDay.com. Use the coupon code left is best. Get 20% off your order. SunsetLakeSebaDay.com. They've got tinctures in all sorts of uh, concentrations, Sebade concentrations. They got tinctures with melatonin. They've got three different flavors of tinctures, the natural, the citrus, and um, the mint. They have uh, Sebade fudge and Sebade coffee, which is my weekend brew. Um, takes the edge off that caffeine, keeps you uh, reasonable. It has helped me, frankly, with having a little patience with my kids. Uh, I must say, it also has helped uh, tremendously with my sleep. Uh, I take um, the the tincture sometimes. I take the gummies if I remember. They have gummies with melatonin. They have sour uh, gummies. They have gummies with a little THC. So, like on a Friday night, when um, you know it's movie night, maybe I'll take a uh, day THC gummy. Uh, just chill a little bit. Uh, they also have smokables. Uh, that you can mix with other smokables or smoke on their own. They have pre-rolls. Uh, just a great product. All third-party um, verified and broken down exactly what's in there. But what you will never find is pesticides because they are pesticide-free. They use integrated pest management. When they grow uh, their sebe day, they, uh, they use regenerative farming practices. So they're great with the land that they work with the University of Vermont on. They are movement partners. They have given tens of thousands of dollars to things like strike funds and refugee resettlement and um, uh, criminal justice reform and uh, food pantries. I mean, just great all around company, great folks over there, mostly employee owned, $20 minimum wage, sunsetlakesebaday.com. Left is best. Left is best. We'll get you 20% off. Long time uh, listeners of the program. All right. I'm going to take a quick break. We come back, we'll be talking to Heather Parton or Digby on this week that was.
Yes, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> it is that time again, uh, Heather Parton or Digby, you may read her stuff at salon.com or at the Uber blog, hullabaloo. Uh, Heather, welcome back to the program. Thanks for having me. Happy Friday. Thank you. Happy Friday to you too. We are all a buzz here because, uh, uh, Emma Viglin was uh, just on, uh, Tim Pool's thing and we did not so far. Uh, don't have to send in um, any type of like uh, rescue team. Uh, <laughs> although he did get very, very angry at one point and um, accused her of uh, somebody uh, telling her what to say when she was on the show. It's, which uh, why that am was... I not surprised? Why does that sound so perfect? Yes. Oh uh, my god. Yeah, he was. Um, uh, couldn't have been um, hmm. more sort of like. Uh, condescending and can't imagine a person less um suited to be condescending well maybe dave rubin uh but uh putting that <laughs> putting Get that aside Logan. <laughs> um a lot of like small stories uh this week um it, 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 or or i should say like mid level stories and much of it was sort of like drowned out by this um drama of a what you know it's like a homemade submarine it feels like mm -hmm. uh going down trying to uh, look at uh the the uh the wreckage of the titanic i don't know that even mama brought it up yesterday I, I i haven't brought it up all week it is um it doesn't feel like a, a politics story uh, to me but i did happen to catch a um a clip of uh james cameron he did um he did what was the big oh he did the titanic right didn't yep. he do that yeah <laughs> yeah and, he made the movie yeah um, and i i guess i was vaguely aware of this but he is deep into no pun intended this like salvaging um yeah. uh stuff i mean deep deep into it yeah. and he's a he's the real deal he does it you know for fun i mean or for for research for he's def definitely uh, an expert on this stuff and he, he, it sounds like he spent like a, a big part of his uh, fortune that he's made from these movies on on this type of stuff. And it, I was watching this clip and it suddenly made me sort of think of this big issue that we have in our politics, which is sort of like disinformation, misinformation in particular uh, in the context around COVID. But it, it, it creates a mentality that goes everywhere. Um, and here's this clip of, uh, of James Cameron. It, I, I found this really interesting. This is, uh, uh, clip number one. Yeah. Well, I've been down there many times. And I know the wreck site very well as, as does my friend, uh, Bob Ballard. I've been made 33 dives. I actually calculated that I've spent more time on the ship than the captain did back in the day. <laughs> um, and of course, uh, you know, as a submersible designer myself, I designed and built a sub to go to the deepest place in the ocean, three times deeper than Titanic. So I understand the the engineering problems associated with with building this type of type of vehicle and all the safety protocols that you have to go through. And uh, I think the, that what Bob said, because I was watching, uh, is absolutely critical for people to to really get the the, the take home message from this, from from our effort here is deep submergence diving is a mature art from the early 60s where there were you know a few accidents nobody was killed in the in the deep submergence until now is more time than between kitty hawk and the lot and the, the flight of the first 747 so if we haven't improved over that period of time and you know we, we have improved drastically over that period of time and uh, the the uh, certification protocols that all other deep submergence vehicles except this one that carry passengers especially paying passengers all over the world in tropical waters uh deep coral reefs other wreck sites and so on um the the safety record is is the gold standard absolutely 
not only no fatalities, but no major incidents requiring all of these assets to converge to a site. Of course, that's the nightmare that we've all lived with, you know, since uh, since all of us entered this this um, this field of deep exploration. We live with it in the back of our minds. But because implosion, as Bob described it, such a violent event, um, is first and foremost in our minds, the pressure boundary, which is what they call the, the hull of the sub, that the people go inside, is obviously first and foremost in our minds as engineers. And we spend so much time and energy on that. And we use all the computerized tools available today, finite element analysis. Uh, we worked on our sphere for our, for our deep, deep vehicle that went to the Challenger Deep for over three years, just in the computer before we even made the thing, and then of course we, we pressure tested it over and over and over, uh, and so on. So, you know, this is a mature art, and many people in the community were very concerned about this sub. And a number of, of uh, you know, of the top players in the, in the uh, deep submergence engineering community even wrote letters to the company saying that what they were doing was too experimental to carry passengers and that needed to be certified and and so on so i'm i'm struck by the similarity of the titanic disaster itself where the captain was repeatedly warned about ice ahead of his ship and yet he steamed at full speed into an ice field on a moonless night and many people died as a result and for a very similar tragedy where warnings went unheeded to take place at the same exact site with all the diving that's going on all around the world. Uh, I, I think it's just astonishing. It's really quite surreal. I mean, what, what, I mean, I found that fascinating. I mean, you know, again, I haven't followed this story really that much. I, I tend to, you know, when I see people following a story like that, I, I'm, it's fine, but I don't, it's just not where I spend my time. But this idea of of people like sort of like cutting against established i mean th that part where you said about you know the the time that we are from like uh you know in terms of like the first submergible to now is like the kitty hawk like uh, uh, by multiple times it's a very mature mm -hmm. science it's been established um yes i imagine there are players in that industry who you know make a lot of money at it um, but there are specific sort of like protocols and mm -hmm. accreditation and peer review and all of these things. And it makes me think about stuff like science and mm -hmm. vaccines and, um, the, the, the idea that like, I'm just asking questions. Uh, well, you're just asking questions until like you start to build the thing and just say like, I'm rule breaking. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. and, and people don't right. like that. And this and that we have a very stark, very measurable, um, uh, you know, example here, but it seems like an analogy to what we saw like this week with, you know, the Hotez and RFK stuff. Absolutely. I mean, uh, I, this is, and this, you know, this, we can go to climate change as well. I mean, the same kind of thing is happening. Um, and I think COVID illustrated it for people like us who, you know, we were actually personally involved. And so I think we probably went a little deeper into the subject than we, than, than we might in other circumstances. Um, and it became clear that there is, and I think that this, I mean, I agree with you. I, I haven't, I didn't follow that story in great, <laughs> to coin a phrase, depth, but I did follow it peripherally as probably most people in the country did. And you know, there seems as though there is this hubris among a certain group of people who believe that, you know, because they do one thing they think well, that they can do everything well. And if they've made a lot of money, that they that, that means that they're a genius. I mean, you see that with, you know, in our media, you know, world where someone like Elon Musk, who, you know, invested in some businesses that did very, very well, and he made a lot of money, which makes him an expert on everything, apparently. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I mean, this is this is definitely something that, you know, we're seeing this rebellion against the scientific method and science and knowledge and expertise. And, you know, I mean, that kind of goes hand in hand often with populism. It's one of the sort of downside of populism, where you see this idea that, you know, the pointy-headed 
professors don't know what they're talking about. You know, they're they're completely leading us astray. And you see all this this rejection of of knowledge essentially. Um, and you know, it's it's we it couldn't be happening at a worse time. I mean, we are dealing with situations in this world that are unprecedented. I'm particularly thinking of climate science, but I think that the, the, the pandemic showed us that we've got you know very, very huge challenges on that front. Um, and it requires expertise. And I mean, I'm not saying that we blindly you know follow whoever is doing, but you have to, it, we're not going to function if we can't have at least more trust in someone like Peter Hotez, who has not only you know vast expertise in the field of vaccines, he's been doing it for decades and has been very successful and is highly regarded amongst his peers, but also has done some incredible things like you know, putting together during COVID free vaccines where he vaccinated hundreds of millions. He got hundreds of millions of people vaccinated with no patent. They didn't. They didn't make any money on the vaccines that he developed, and they and they they you know produced them and and uh, distributed them around the world, and they're going after this guy, you know. I mean, of all things, I mean, this is not only a person who's an expert; he's also an incredibly, you know, decent mensch who does things to help mankind. And naturally, of course, that's the person that they go after. So, I mean, I see what you're, I see what you're saying as well. You know, we're watching these things sort of happen. This idea that, uh, I mean, I don't know what happened with the sub, but it seems pretty clear that this guy, the, the people who, who ran that particular operation believed that they didn't need to follow the rules, that they, that they knew better that, oh, we've made some dives. And so, you know, and it, and it worked out. So it'll continue to work out. And there were people apparently screaming about this and yeah. going, this is crazy. And they didn't listen. And, you know, there's a lot of that going around and people are getting, or people are dying because of it. You know, this isn't just some abstract conversation. This is something that that is actually killing people. So I share your concern with this. I mean, it's so sort of an ongoing um, kind of, you know, problem that I think that we're going to be dealing with for a while. And it's very, very unnerving. Well, you know, I mean, as we're talking about it, I distinctly remember, you know, uh, the, and, and we should say here, yeah, pop this up, Bradley. I mean, you, you mentioned climate change. Like, here's another example. Um, this is, this apparently is the water temperature, uh, the, right. uh, it, within the seas the, as it's being measured. And I mean, this is, um, this is pretty extraordinary and not in a good way. Um, it, 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 this is, uh, look at that red line. It's crazy how, um, how this thing is, has gone up in, in June. All those blue lines are from 1982 to 2011, I guess, like the, the mean, uh, temperature there. And we are off the charts now yeah. by, but you know, and it's obviously it's summer uh, and you, you get a little bump in summer. Now you can look in past years, it's been a little bit later now it's, it's summer here, but I mean, uh, but um, this is, this is seasonal. There's also like an El Nino, but all of these things that happen over the course that are normal that happen over the course of any given like decade, mm -hmm. let's say are more extreme. Mm -hmm. And there is, and in this, you know, we went through this during the Bush years, though, too, because yeah. because there was a distinct anti-intellectualism. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't consider myself, uh, you know, I, I, I consider myself a little bit anti-intellectual. I was not, you know, particularly, you know, well educated uh, as a kid and, and this and that. And I find sometimes people to be a little stuffy. But the idea of like the anti-expertise, and I'm not talking mm -hmm. the fake expertise of like, you know, people put on TV and they get a Chiron necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, but there was a real move um, under the Bush years to sort of like disvalue to uh, uh, this type of like uh, expert and intellectualism. Uh, but we've seen this throughout Republican and right wing and conservative mm -hmm. politics for decades upon decades upon decades. And this feels like we're, 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 we're getting to the culmination. And I don't know that, I don't know if it goes the other direction. I don't know either. I mean, and it's very disturbing because 
you know, that like, you know, you mentioned that during the Bush years, there was a very famous saying, which everyone will remember, you know, that Ron Suskind interviewed some uh, nameless, uh, you know, appointee at the Pentagon, I believe it was, who said, you know, you all are in the reality based community. And while you're, you know, thinking through what, you know, what it all means, we will be acting and we're just going to move forward. It's part of that whole, you know, that kind of thing about, you know, well, yeah, we destroy things and then we create it all again from the bottom up. This, I, this idea, and some of it comes from Silicon Valley, I think, and that whole kind of the tech bro kind of ethos. And some of it comes from a very, very strong populist strain that Republicans have, you know, basically hijacked in recent years, but basically as a way to maintain electoral power. I mean, that's what they do. You know, they sort of are feeding people. You really saw it during COVID. And I think we're seeing it now, you know, in virtually everything. And and using that kind of populist impulse, which I agree with you, Sam. I mean, look, you know, I came up, you know, in the wake of the Vietnam War and, you know, the mistrust in expertise was very legitimate because, you know, the whole best and the brightest thing. I mean, these were people who had, right. you know, flow charts about how many body bags, you know, were acceptable. I mean, this was the kind of thing that was, you know, people have a right to be mistrustful of that. It's important that you always maintain a certain distance and not just sort of, blind, like I said, blindly follow. But at the same time, this wholesale rejection of science at a time like this, where you see a chart like you just showed and people just, you know, saying, well, that's ridiculous, you know. How come it got cold last winter? I had to have my heat on all the whole time. You know, that kind of stuff. Um, it's it's very, very concerning. And I'm not sure it goes the other way either. I don't know how you put the genie back in the bottle with this. I mean, this is this is going to be a very, very difficult period, I think, for the whole planet. You know, it's not this isn't a specifically American problem. I mean, this is happening everywhere. And, it, you know, that's probably one of the reasons why you see the rise of authoritarianism. It's coming up because... It, people are always looking for somebody to take charge, whether and they don't want, you know, the intellectual pointy headed professors being the ones to do it. It's a very scary thing. This is a little bit, you know, I mean, uh, we're, we're getting a little bit in, uh, you know, esoteric yeah. here. But <laughs> but 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 it's interesting because there is this sort of paradox, because what you're talking about in terms of Vietnam, like there was a proper and 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 falling with it with the assassinations of, of uh, MLK and the Kennedys. And also, uh, you know, uh, with with Watergate, there there developed a, in my estimation, a very appropriate skepticism towards authority. But it also bled into the idea of of expert and and intellectuals in a way that I think is incredibly unhealthy. And there was this sort of like liber th th this is this sort of like libertarian paradox. Mm -hmm. Because on one hand, you know, their 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 anti-authoritarianism that they presume is also like we all need to be our own experts, right? Like, right. I mean, this is Do your like, research. Every, yeah. every every debate I have ever had with a libertarian mm -hmm. comes down to like, well, you, you you don't go to a doctor who uh, overcharges you because you do your own research. Or you don't, you know, like as mm -hmm. if like healthcare was like buying a, you know, a, a, a right. stereo system that, uh, you know, tw you know, Tweeter back in the day or whatever that was, <laughs> um, uh, Twitter, et cetera, whatever it was. And th this whole idea of like, well, we don't need any type of centralization. We don't need to rely on experts. We do it ourselves. Is the same sort of libertarianism that streak mm -hmm. that, that put those people in that sub that, uh, you know. Yep make uh, Joe Rogan think that he can assess these things by just, if it's on the internet, I mean, whoa, I shouldn't use Wi-Fi. And, um, and even, you know, and, and you and I used to be a regular guest on, uh, on ring of fire back in the day when, uh, Bobby Kennedy mm -hmm. was one of the hosts. Um, as Bobby got deeper into, uh, this, uh, denial, you know, this vaccine, um, uh, d denialism really in my estimation, mm -hmm. Um, this libertarian streak sort of like in enhanced itself because it has mm -hmm. to on some right. level. And um, it is uh, it, it, it's and then everything becomes subjective. That's also like mm -hmm. a cousin to you get your facts. I have my facts, um, et, et cetera, et cetera. Um, well, 
Where did you fall on that, uh, you know, uh, Hotez debate thing? Well, yeah, I'm not sure I understand oh, what when, you mean. When Joe call? Rogan, you know, challenged him to debate, did you follow that oh, at right. all? Or, or did you were yeah, able to I avoid followed that? it. You know, I just, I'm, con <laughs> I guess I'm a little surprised that you would ask me where I fall on well, it. Well, um, I know because, where you, you fall know, on clearly. it. Clearly. <laughs> well, um, we, there should be, I mean, this is the, this is the dilemma though. Like on one hand, you don't want a scientist who is not, and, and, and this was a problem with the education, uh, with education reform. Like every educator I ever, um, uh, you know, interviewed over the course of like this corporate education reform movement, uh, they were like, you know, being an educator is to be specifically nuanced, to be mm -hmm. like able to address kids as they come case by case. And they were almost defenseless in a corporate reform movement that was built on these sort of like broad generalities that sounded okay. Like we should be measuring how teachers do it on a number scale, like the way that we measure our, you know, widget sales. Um, right. And educators were sort of like defenseless in the sort of political arena. Right. And we can't expect like a scientist to be able to operate on a podcast in the way a trial litigator and a podcast host do. Um, but it's almost like w w they should have a core of scientist communication <laughs> department. You know what I mean? But that doesn't exist. I agree. It's a very well, difficult I mean, I problem. It is a difficult problem. My, my understanding of it was that Hotez has actually spoken with both RFK Jr. and Rogan um, more than, than once and has tried to engage in good faith with both of them. Uh, from my understanding, he did, you know, he's not been avoiding them or running from them. Right. It's just that it reached this point after I think RFK was on, uh, was on uh, the show and they decided somehow that they were going to challenge Hotez to come on the show and debate these points. Uh, and particularly, I think it's about, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a point that's been argued over and over and over again about autism and vaccines. And that is, that is something that Hotez, he's written a book about it. He has an autistic daughter. I mean, he is, he, he, and he is one of the world renowned experts on this topic. And um, he just, you know, I think that the consensus among the scientists, not just him was look, <clears throat> you can't, you know, you can't spend all your time trying to, persuade people who are not arguing in good faith. And, and, and he had been persuaded, I think, over time with both of them that they were unpersuadable that, that, you know, I mean, Rogan, I don't know, he's all over the place. You know, he'll, whatever you tell him five minutes later, he'll, he'll believe it and then he'll stop believing it. You know, he's different, but RFK Jr. has, this has been, this is his life's work at this point. And he's been on this for many, many years. And I think Hotez felt like there's, there's really no point. I don't know the answer to how to deal with this. I mean, this isn't just about vaccines or just about this particular end of science. This is about <coughs> conspiracy theories. And it's about this, and it's happening everywhere. I mean, I've been reading a lot about conspiracy theories lately and just trying to understand why this phenomenon is happening. And it's kind of a chicken or the egg thing because when you lose faith in institutions and in expertise, people are naturally gonna turn to something to sort of explain the world to them. You know, religion is no longer sort of providing for a lot of people the, 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 the answers that they once had. They're rejecting science, they're rejecting the normal institutions of government and various things like science and medicine and things like that. So they turn to conspiracy theories. And of course the internet, it provides this, you know, this flood of disinformation for them to glom onto if they want to. I mean, it's very, it, it's, a, it's a big, big problem and, and there are people exploiting it, which I look at somebody like Rogan. I mean, this is his bread and butter, right? I yep. mean, this, he keeps this part of the, the culture sort of churned up over and over again on various things. And you've got people like RK Jr., who I think is sincere in his beliefs. He's just completely mistaken. But, you know, I think he truly believes it. And there are plenty of people who truly believe it. And they're just, they're just plain wrong. So we're in a period like this. And that's why I said, you know, I said earlier, and I think this is really why we're seeing this rise in authoritarianism is that, you know, you're going to see when society starts to fragment in this way and you don't have any kind of common cultural touchstones and people are no longer kind of living in the same plane, basically. You've got Bizarro World here and Earth One over here and, you know, people just aren't communicating at all. That's that's an opening for strongmen. And, you know, you're seeing that start to start to really bubble up in a lot of different places, including here.
Well, that's the that's the paradox too. Is that like yeah. it, there's the in in the fact that it's an opening for strongmen and an opening for conspiracies, even if they are ostensibly anti-establishment right. in some way, give an indication of what the underlying malaise is. Because these yeah. two things should be contrary to. I mean, they should be contradictory, right? Like. Right. If you have people who are anti-establishment, you should be less inclined to give power to one authority. But exactly. I think that like, you know, what what it's a function of. And I think like COVID really makes this clear because, you know, we've uh, in many respects memory hold that all of these anti-vax people, not all, but a, 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 a lot of the people sort of like um, uh, promoting the anti-vax stuff were COVID deniers early on. They were yeah, out right. there with a microphone going like, I'm in front of these uh, refrigerator morgues, but uh, I don't see anybody at the hospital and, yeah. you know, that type of thing. I mean, people forget yeah. that's what this started uh -huh. on day one, w it was. well before we had any vaccines. And, and I think it is a, you get these conspiracies where people feel completely disempowered. And like you say, religion was one of those things that would empower people in some fashion, allow me to explain what's going on and, I'm going to get my just desserts when I die in heaven and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And um, in the and we felt incredibly disempowered during COVID. Of course, it's like you know this natural yeah. phenomenon that's like ongoing. But I also think that like our political system is so messed up in this country, where we have such an imbalance of 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 power within the hands of a very few people in the context mm -hmm. of like, uh, you know, wealth inequality or whatever it is. And I think that, um, that I I is, is breeding this widespread sort of like conspiratorial thinking across because it's, it's just much easier. It's too hard to think of the, you know, the moving, uh, pieces in all of this stuff and try and make some sense of it and trying to get a sense of like how I should react. And so therefore mm -hmm. I, I embrace this sort of secret knowledge mm -hmm. that if I can just crash that Bilderberger group or get them to stop drinking the <laughs> right. blood of an owl or whatever it is, <laughs> then uh, it'll fix everything. Right. Yeah. Oh, I, I agree with you completely. I mean, there, that is just that, you know, people feel at sea and they're, they're finding, and of course the internet that I don't think that can be under, you know, underestimated as a, as a, a factor in all this, because it's providing people, I mean, there've always been conspiracy theories, of course, there's nothing new in that, but that it is providing this, it's supercharged, you know, this kind of conspiracy information flow that is allowing people to find each other and to find this, you know, these, this crazy stuff and to then, you know, form a whole belief system around it. I mean, it's very frightening. And, you know, you see people like, and I, I won't get off on a tangent here, but I think it's important to sort of consider this. I just wrote about it this morning for Salon. You, you know, you have Trump and Trump is just, he's sui generis. He's, he's somebody, this is, Trump is about Trump. And he has, it had a very specific effect on people it, politically in this country. There were the populist strain found a voice in him, you know, God only knows why, but for whatever reason they did. But I think he's more of a transitional figure. He's about him and it's a cult of personality, but it has opened the door to something new. And the new thing that's happening with the Republican Party is, I think, embodied in the person of Ron DeSantis. And I think what you're seeing there, there is the prototype for the new American strongman yep. who, who is using the power of the state. And he and that seems to be giving, I mean, it's not working for him right now, because, and it may never work for him personally, because he's kind of a, a dud as a politician. And But the ideas that he's pr proposing and the, 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 the worldview that he expounds about using government to, um, you know, as he puts it, destroy leftism and to, to basically root out uh, anything that doesn't, you know, comport with what he and his people consider to be traditional values and American values. That way of thinking and the, and the use of government to do this with the help of many other institutions on the right, including up to and including the Supreme Court, um, that is, you know, I think that that's going to be the new challenge. You know, Trump isn't going to last forever. I mean, this is going to be, God knows it's got to be his last campaign, right? And right. win or lose and God help us, he, he loses. But that his, his thing is unique. And I don't think anybody's going to ever be able to replicate that. But it did, you know, kind of 
uh, give the Republican Party a way of morphing into this new thing, which we're seeing, we're seeing it happen in the Congress. You're seeing these people and you know, you like, it's easy to sort of dismiss them as, oh, they're a bunch of nuts or they're just pandering to the crazy base and blah, blah, blah. I don't really, I'm not sure about that. I actually think that there's a new philosophy developing there. And that plays into what we were just talking about, this whole idea of having a strong man, um, you know, authoritarian kind of figure or it's not even a figure but a, a, a belief system that supports these ideas and allows people to have something to hang on to i mean you look at the enthusiasm that comes from these people like you know moms of moms for liberty this yeah. group goes in and bans books i mean that's that's the kind of thing that you're seeing so anyway it's 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 a little i mean it's it, it keep your eye on that because i think that that's something that's you know bubbling up in any case. I think that's, uh, I mean, I think that is an in incredibly important point. And I, and, and I, it, it really does feel to me like this is, there is a quality of this era that is like the, the, uh, the, a similar time, frankly, I mean, you know, I hadn't even occurred, but there's so many similarities to the first uh, couple of decades of the 20th century. Yeah. Right. And that's where we saw like sort of the reemergence of the KKK, the mm -hmm. reestablishment coming out of like, I mean, this anti wokeism, uh, they called mm -hmm. it something different at the time. And uh, this sort of like revisionist history, uh, which they called at the time, you know, the, the sort of uh, lost cause and right. the way that I mean, this is when all of the Confederate soldier statues went up in the 1910s. Mm -hmm. And there was this real pushback to yeah. the, um, the broadening of the broadening of 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 the uh, of like the rights and the the, mm -hmm. the emancipation i mean obviously it right. didn't go that far but uh, you know people were theoretically at least um you know or you know not categorically slaves anymore um right. at that point and this does feel like a similar era and i guess you know the real fundamental question is is this thing that is happening to uh, society, and I agree with you, I think there's a fundamental shift that's gone on with the Republican Party that has been going really for the past 20 years. I mean, you know, when really, you know, arguably 40 years, uh, but mm -hmm. really has has accelerated and, and COVID accelerated it. The question is, is like, is it expanding outside of the borders, if you will, of this 48% cohort or 35, mm -hmm. cause it doesn't feel like that is, it feels like it's expanding within that cohort. Now, maybe at that point it starts leaking out, but mm -hmm. it, it seems like it's spreading the fertile ground are the same people who voted for Mitt Romney, if you will, you know, but, um, and, and, and voted for, but, but they're, they're becoming more pure. It, it feels like right, it's no right. longer pretending it's, it's like, it's infecting it's 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 real but within certain sort of like psychographic boundaries i think you know it's a very interesting question i actually addressed that in the piece that i wrote today about this because i don't think it is expanding anything i mean there's some talk you know that there's there are con you know social conservatives in the latino communities you know various latino communities some talk about certain you know aspects of of uh, you know black culture that's sort of attracted in some ways but really and truly it, that's just not happening. If anything, it's the opposite. What we are seeing is a backlash that's developed among the the normal people right. who are, you know, who are now, you know, have found themselves, you know, sort of motivated to organize themselves uh, to fight this back. And, you know, we'll see if this goes beyond Trump. I mean, because Trump obviously is such an, you know, abhorrent, obnoxious character, that that is a very motivating thing. But I don't think it, I don't think it is just Trump because the abortion issue is not Trump. I mean, that's completely different. And that has motivated people, you know, massively and is making a huge difference in American politics. It's also, you know, I think there are some other issues that, you know, the whole assault on democracy, there's the gun issue, which seems to me to be gaining salience for the first time that I can remember where I'm feeling some actual action on the part of the anti-gun proliferation people that are, that is making a difference. You know, there, there are issues and, and, and issues, you know, tend to, people go, oh, issues don't matter in politics. It's all about tribalism and personality and whatever. Yeah, they do matter. 
when they're big issues that stand for something else. And what this is, is what Ron DeSantis does, and I think what Republicans will continue to do, they'll sh run around shrieking about freedom and liberty, as they always have, right? I mean, this that does go back, you know, at, since the post-war era. And that's the libertarian thing you were talking about. Individual freedom. Everybody's got to have freedom, 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 freedom. And DeSantis says this, but his definition of freedom, I do not think scans for the majority of Americans, because I don't think book bans say freedom. I don't think telling parents that they're not allowed to get their kids the medical care that they believe that they should have is freedom. And I don't think that telling women that they're not allowed to, you know, ha to create their own families the way that they want to want to create them is freedom. And I don't think most Americans are seeing it that way. So you're in this big tension of having this long standing thing with with Republicans talking about freedom and redefining it as authoritarianism. And that just strikes me as fundamentally not something that most Americans will buy. I just don't think they will. I mean, that we're all a bunch of dumb, dumb shits, you know, I mean, we know that and we've all got all kinds of problems, but that's freedom and liberty. Those things are enshrined in whatever American national character that we have and that most of us share. And that includes all the immigrants as well. And the idea, and it's been, you know, unfairly applied and people have been fighting for more freedom the whole time. And it's always a battle and it's always, a, you know, a, a challenge. But I just think that the, the belief in that as something that is you know, is not this sort of cramped libertarian view, which just says, well, you know, I shouldn't have to pay taxes. Um, that's not what freedom is. And I don't think they're going to win on that. I mean, maybe I'm being too optimistic, but I really don't think that that is, that is, a, that is going to sell. So I think they are going to confine themselves to a minority of, you know, angry, upset, mostly white, older people who are just don't like the idea of other people having freedom and they believe that freedom means they get they get to keep those other people down that's basically their belief system it, it, it's so interesting because what i feel like you and i have seen in particular as we you know we both sort of like began to engage in this in some professional or semi-professional way back in the the early aughts is that the republican party seems to like cycle through different issues um to see one that will expand outside of their sort of like their, you know, like I say, their, their, uh, their, the psychographic fencing that they have that expands outside of that as a way of bringing people in. So like, we're seeing this with the trans stuff, I think. Yeah. And, and, you know, I just, the, the other day uh, saw a, um, a polling that showed Republicans support for, uh, gay relationships has dropped by like 14 points in the past like year or two. You know, it, it, it was, it was, it was low. And then it, it you know, crept up after, you know, gay mm -hmm. marriage and everybody's like, wait a second, we were told cats and dogs were going to come down from the sky and my marriage was going to be ruined because gay people are getting married and none of that happened. Uh, and so Republican numbers went up even a little bit of softening on the democratic uh, side as well. I, I, I wonder if I could cross tab that with age, what's going on there? Because my oh, guess sure. is, I it am is sure. older people whose positions have softened back to where they were 10 years ago or what they grew up with. And so this is not, in my estimation, my hope, um, which is not to say that it isn't, uh, you know, we obviously, this Neil need to deal with this now because these laws are going to be on the books. And yeah. it's one thing to say, you know, popular opinion will, 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 the pendulum will swing back. It's another thing to say they'll swing back in such a way that all these laws are going to be reversed right. uh, in due course. I, I mean, it, 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 there is a huge new obstacle that, you know, it's almost like, you know, reversing a global warming on some level. Like yeah. you, can, you can slow it, but that doesn't mean that you've, you've stopped what has already occurred yeah. and we're not going to have certain problems. Um, it doesn't feel like that's an issue that is going to expand much further. Now we could be wrong. And that's why I think people need to be vigilant about it. But, you know, nine 11 came up and really added something, you know, and we had 10 years of Islamophobia, at least now you have the Republican party. sort of trying to embrace Muslims because, uh, the more, uh, fundamentalist of, uh, it, within that community mm -hmm. have a problem with gay people. 
Um, mm -hmm. you know, like, like most uh, religious fundamentalists do. Um, and, uh, the, it, it's going to be interesting to see where they keep going because it, it feels like they're running out of things. Uh, it's not that they can't keep going back to the well with demonizing black or brown people or immigrants mm -hmm. or Muslim people when it, when it suits them or, or gay people, but progress moves on and that's right one of the things that happens in this country as time goes on is that people m move and 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 meet people now there's a different sorting that's happening so that they may not my point is i guess it's going to be harder and harder for them to find something that breaks out of right. their psychographic uh you know sort of like borders and brings new people in that doesn't mean that they can't be you know, fortified. Uh, but that brings up a very sort of like volatile situation in a society yeah. where like there's a chunk that is like solid as a rock. They can't expand, but they're not going to break up either. Right. And we're seeing, we, I think we know what the options start to look like to those people. I mean, we saw that on January 6th that it starts to look like they're going to have to take extraordinary means to achieve what they believe is, you know, the right uh, path for, for the country. I mean, that's why you hear Ron DeSantis saying things like, I, I am the one who can destroy leftism. I mean, he said, destroy leftism. I mean, that's, that's a hell of a thing to say. I mean, you know, what does that exactly mean? But that, that is, that is where you start to see this kind of, and I think it's, I think, I think it's a real concern. I mean, this isn't just, you know, us sitting around chewing the fat on what are these people up to? I mean, when they, they, they are unable to expand their base in, in any sort of, you know, meaningful fashion because they are unable and unwilling to accept this new multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-racial society that welcomes people who are, you know, do not follow the traditional values of the old white culture. I mean, that they, they just are unable to do that. And if they and being unable to do that means that they can't have a majority because that's where the country is going. And even among all these these, you know, elderly white people who are, you know, suddenly terrified of, you know, gay marriage again. Um, you know, they're all, they have relatives who are younger than them, who are gay, who are trans, who are married to, you know, someone of another race or, you know, I mean, this is the way, this is the, the new country sure, that they're able to do, you know, I mean, that's just, you know, that's just the way that they're, that's just the way that they are. And I, I do not believe that, that they can possibly win by legitimate means unless they're willing to reach out and start engaging in some form of persuasion. And in the old days, the Republicans did have, you know, some thoughts that maybe they should do that, that they could do that. I mean, George Bush, for all of his horrifying flaws, which, you know, are, you know, you and I know better than anybody, Legion. he did, you know, understand that part, which was that in order for him, for order for Republicans to um, prevail, they they were going to have to look beyond that white base and they were going to have to find new ways to deal with things like immigration and and racial race relations and things like that um and and they just completely have abandoned that now now it's just totally. by force which is what desantis is saying don't worry guys i'm going to take this power i'm going to take the power of the state and i'm going to enforce our beliefs in this country we will use whatever it takes and he's is saying we'll do it against you know, education will do it against, you know, um, any, any institution that opposes us, including by the way, business itself. Yep. And which is, you know, so, I mean, that, that, you know, hopefully this guy will flame out and that, that will, we won't have to hear from him again, but he's not going to be the last one to be pushing he's this. Not because be the, I don't no, see, the war on wokeism is going to continue. That is, he's tapping into something. He's not inventing it. And yeah. it, it is something that exists within the, um, the Republican party. I mean, let's be clear here too. Like it's no coincidence granted, you know, he has a, a third or 20% or he's getting beat badly by, by Donald Trump Yeah. in the polling, you know, who knows if that holds up, but he's beating the other people in the, in the race mm -hmm. by even more, you know, by just by their own. So it's not, it's like, 
the, the, the Republican party wants that they may yes. not want it in the form of DeSantis, but they want that. And I mean, yeah. just po- folks need to just take a second and just imagine if AOC campaigned for president. I'm just trying to come up with like somebody who's the most like sort of, you know, most uh, the, the the right perceives as being, you know, one of the most evil or Nancy Pelosi, for that matter, mm-hmm. got up, uh, you know, whoever it is and said, like, we're going to wage a war on conservatism. We're going to yep. wage a war on, mm-hmm. you know, the on like you know, uh, a sleepism or whatever it is. Like we're <laughs> going to, you know, uh, I plan to destroy conservatism. That is, that we're, is, yeah, we're going to wage a yeah, war on Christmas. Destroy. I mean, honestly, that's like sort of what <laughs> you're talking about. And, you know, I, I would even be like, oh, that's pretty funny, but that's weird. I mean, you know, like, and, uh, and I'm the biggest, uh, you know, anti-Christmas warrior I know. <laughs> and I would still be like, well, it is a weird thing for a politician to be running on. But for them, it's no, it's like no. the problem with DeSantis. We don't know if you're sincere about your war on wokeism. <laughs> right. You're not doing it as well as uh, Trump does. it. I mean, that's the issue. It's not the right. issue that you're literally doing speeches about a war on wokeism. I and mean, that's like, that is... Yeah. There's not even a dog whistle there practically anymore. Oh, no, there's no dog whistles anymore, Sam. That dog, they don't dog whistle anymore. They just say it right out. And that is, you know, I mean, this is, they're not, I think that is one of the big changes. I know when Donald Trump came along, that was one of the things that he did. He released them from the dog whistle. And uh, so they're just saying it right out. And they have a hardcore group of people. And in fact, most Republicans, apparently, as you say, when you put Trump and DeSantis together, that's the that vast majority of the Republican Party right there. Totally. And that that is what they're that's what they are about. And and you know, by the way, I mean it's gonna be a close not it's gonna be a close election, not because uh, that the majority isn't, you know, far more um, you know, I mean it's reasonably close, but you know, the majority if it, we had a normal democracy, this it wouldn't be an issue because the Democrats have won the last two with pretty good margins. It's the anachronistic electoral college that makes Without it dicey, and Without they will exploit that too. You know, to the ends of the earth for sure. And I imagine Steve Bannon is sitting there right now trying to figure out how many, uh, how many, how many votes uh, in in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania could someone like RFK Jr. bring in oh, as a VP he candidate. Is. As a He's VP doing candidate. it openly, yeah. Yep. VP candidate, wouldn't that be great? I mean, honest to God, and God help I, me, I, let's hope he doesn't do that. I mean, I, I, I honestly like, um, you know, over the past like week or two, I've been trying to figure out what's going on, and I don't think that's in the forefront of uh, of 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 Kennedy's mind, but it is in the forefront of Bannon's mind. I think. Oh, absolutely, and, no doubt um, about it. It's not inconceivable to me. That after a primary, um, it would be hard for uh, RFK to rationalize in his mind, like, hey, wait a second. Um, Every reason why I would run as a Democrat, I want to bring people together. What better way to do it in a unity ticket? And what better way to become president than (laughs) being VP for, you know, the president? (laughs) Um, I mean, I, I... I think it's a real uh, thing that I don't know has really started to like dawn like on, but you know, the, we'll yeah. see. But and between that and no labels and, you know, we've got, you know, Cornell West running. I mean, there, we're starting to see some real potential issues here that, you know, I'm sure we'll be talking about. We've got a long way to go, yep. but um, kind of scary, a little yep. scary. Uh, Heather Parton, Always a pleasure. Folks can check out your writing at salon.com two or three times a week, is it? Three times a week, Monday, three Wednesday, Friday. And uh, and every day at uh, Hullabaloo. Uh, yep. Don't miss it. Um, Heather, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It was great. I really enjoyed this conversation. Me too. All right. Talk to you soon. All right. All right, folks. Um, what, uh, what should we do now? Um, should we, uh, I guess we should go to, by the- I know we <laughs> uh, like trying to like both prep and dip into the, uh, the, I don't think the, a lot of prep got done. <laughs> yeah. The Emma thing, uh, we should, um, uh,
we should take a break. Can we get Emma on the phone? Bradley, have you have you been in touch with her? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to see if once she's at the airport. She's in transit in. now, I think. She's in transit. We could. Why can't we talk to her on the car in the car? Uh, oh, Virginia. because uh, uh, is she surrounded by uh, uh, Tim Pool's guards? Yeah, I think I think the driver is a is a associate. So <laughs> <laughs> put him on the phone. <laughs> put him on the yeah. Let's. She should interview him live. What do you think about Tim Pool? It's a job. Let's get some more content. It's a job. It's a job. What are you going to do? Um, folks, it is your support that makes this show possible. Um, when you um, become a member of the Majority Report, you not only uh, help the show survive and thrive, you get the free show free of commercials, you get uh, the fun half, you get to I am us uh, in the fun half. The app is free at majorityapp.com, but uh, it has special features for members. That's one of them. Uh, and it's your support that keeps this show going. Um, you can become a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. I also, I can't wait to hear uh, Emma's description of uh, the compound. The with atmosphere the, afterwards? Yeah. The, like, I want to hear about the, uh, the skateboard style. park. Yeah. Because apparently it's super cool. I wonder if a, Emma's going to come back just like all starry eyed. Like we need a we need a skate park. So cool. We need to update our upgrade our cool factor. I don't know. Uh, Show me a picture of a hallway where they have uh, uh, sort of um, illustrations, like a courtroom almost <laughs> illustrations of all the guests, and uh, I'll just say it looks like uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene might have uh, slipped the artist a twenty. <laughs> uh also, um, justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY. You get 10% off. Check out Just Coffee. Great coffee, folks. Uh, Bradley, what's happening? Uh, what happened this week on uh, ESVN? Yeah, so on Monday, we spoke about the big uh, Bradley Beal trade to the Phoenix Suns, um, wrapped up the NBA and Stanley Cup finals, uh, as well as talked about um, the recent interview Dwayne Wade did with Shannon Sharp about his uh, his daughter Zaya and how good of a dad he is compared to certain other parents and how they handle the issues like this. So uh, youtube.com slash ESPN show for the full broadcast and for clips if you want some of the segments in more bite-sized capacities. Matt, what's happening on Left Reckoning? Uh, Left Reckoning this weekend, patreon.com says Left Reckoning for patrons. We are putting up an interview with Brian Box Brown. He's a uh, cartoonist and a, a weed legalization advocate who just wrote a long comic tracing uh, sort of propaganda and marketing to children from all the way from Bernays and uh, the rise of propaganda in the 20s and 30s to uh, the He-Man action figures of the 80s. Uh, so uh, it's a really interesting conversation. Um, and uh, check it out, patreon.com says Left Reckoning. All right, folks, we're going to take a uh, break, head into the fun half. Uh, we'll probably take uh, some uh, some phone calls today. Uh, I think a lot of you watched the uh, Emma's appearance on uh, Tim Pool's Apparently, show. I don't know if they switched it. Somebody said they switched it, but maybe it was this way at the beginning of the stream. But Tim Pool's live chat was set to, uh, you had to be subscribed for five minutes before you were able to comment on it. Mm. Mm, so smart. some of our people might have been over there. Interesting. All right. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, we'll take calls in a bit. Um, see you. Oh, you know what I wanted to do too? Just like a uh, uh, shout out uh, uh, Bradley, Matt, and Emma's work this week. Also, John Aaron, who is our booking producer. And uh, Dorsey and Maria and Chris. Uh, Dorsey's running and uh, Kelly. Uh, who are doing all the sort of like uh, backroom uh, stuff and optimizing and um, channeling and social media. Uh, great job uh, by everybody this week. See you in the fun half. You right. are in for it. All right, folks. 646-257-3920. See you in the fun half. Oh, no. Oh, no. Are you ready? Who sent us this? Alpha males are back, 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 back. Boy, back. And the alpha males are back, back. Just as delicious as you could imagine. The alpha males are back, 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 back. Boy, back. 
and the alpha males are back, 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 back. Just wanna degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it to my throat. Alpha males are back, 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 back. Snowflakes says what? The alpha males are back, 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 back. You are a madman. And the alpha males are back, back. Oh no, Sam Cedar! What a whoa! Well, what a fucking nightmare! What a fucking nightmare! Can we bring back DJ yeah, or a couple of them. Just put them in rotation. DJ Dan. Well, the problem with those is they're like forty-five seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough for the break. That's fucking nonsense. See, white people doing drugs that look worse than normal white people, and all white people look disgusting. And the alpha males are psych. Fuck them. Fuck them. Oh. Snowflake says what? What 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 matter <laughs> have you tried doing an impression on a college campus I, I think that there's no reason why reasonable people across the divide can't all agree with this psych and the alpha males are back 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 and the africans are black 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 african and the alpha males are black 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 and the africans are back 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 when you see Donald Trump out there, doesn't a little part of you think that America deserves to be taken over by jihadists? Keep it at 100. Can't knock the hustle. Come on! Fuck them. Fuck them. Things I do for the bigger game plan. By the way, it's my birthday! It's my birthday! Happy birthday to me, Jew boy! I have a thought experiment for you. And the alpha males are back. Back. Africans are black. Black. Alpha males are black. Black. We are back, Sam Cedar, on the Majority Report uh, as we speak. Emma Vigland is being uh, guarded by uh, multiple Tim Pool um, uh, personnel. Send a team down to West Virginia. To get her. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Um, Ed BC says, uh, been a member for two months now. Come by way of Ben Burgess. Let me get that sweet shofar. Also, Alma killed it on Tim Pool. She hit him with that rope of dope. Yeah. Nice. Here's the show far for you. Uh, lefty band teacher says, still watching Emma's appearance. Sam, you live in Tim's brain. He's really upset about the music thing, yeah. which 